Okay, I thought I'd start off the physics section by taking a look at SI units. Now, SI units are a good place to start when starting to learn physics, but even if you don't plan to be studying physics for the IMAT, you still should pay attention to this video because SI units can show up in other sections as well. Now, SI units just stands for the International System of Units. Think things like meters, seconds, grams, these types of units. You need to become very comfortable with these for the IMAT. And we're also going to take a look at some SI derived units. These are units that are used for certain physical quantities. For instance, the Newton is used to represent force and so on. But we'll take a look at that in just a second. For now, let's just start by taking a look at the multiples and submultiples of SI units. And this is something you have to become comfortable with. And it's not difficult. It just requires some basic memorization. So we'll start with the submultiples. The first one is deci. And what does deci mean? Well, it just means 10 to the power minus 1. That is one tenth of the base SI unit. For instance, a decimeter is one tenth of a meter. A decigram is one tenth of a gram. A deciliter is one tenth of a liter, and so on. And the prefix for deci is a lowercase d. Okay, let's move on. So if we go further downwards, we have centi, which is denoted by a lowercase c. For instance, centimeters, centigrams, centiliters, and so on. And this is just one one hundredth of the base SI unit. One centimeter is just one one hundredth of a meter. Okay, going further, we have milli, which is one one thousandth, and that is given by a lowercase m. We then have micro, that is one millionth of the base SI unit. And micro is denoted by the Greek letter mu. Okay, moving on, we then have nano, which is one billionth of the base SI unit. And that is denoted by a lowercase n. And then we have pico, which is one trillionth of the base SI unit. And we denote that by a lowercase p. Okay, now there are more submultiples than just these ones, but these are the ones that you have to remember for the IMAT. Okay, so these were submultiples. These are all fractions of the base multiple. But as you know, we can also go the other way. We can get larger values of the actual base SI unit. And these are what we refer to as multiples of the SI unit. And the first multiple has the prefix deca, which is 10 times the size of the actual base SI unit. So a decameter is 10 meters, a decagram is 10 grams, and so on. Okay, then we have hecto, and hecto is 100 times the size of the base SI unit. A hectometer is 100 meters, hectogram 100 grams, and so on. And the prefix for hecto is a lowercase h. Then we have the more used one, which is kilo, which is 1,000 times the base SI unit. So kilometers, kilograms, kiloliters, these are more frequently used than hecto and deca. And as I'm sure you know, the prefix for kilo is lowercase k. We then have a mega, which is one million times the size of the base SI unit. So a megameter is one million meters. And here the prefix is an uppercase M. Make sure that you remember that it's the uppercase M, because a lowercase M would be milli, and that's definitely not the same thing. Okay, then we have giga, and giga is one billion times the size of the base SI unit, and that is denoted by an uppercase G. And then we have tera, which is one trillion times the size of the base SI unit. And we denote that by an uppercase T. And yeah, these multiples do go on further than this, but these are the ones you need to remember for the IMAT. So for the IMAT, you have to remember what magnitude these submultiples and multiples are associated with. So remember the prefix, remember the actual letter that denotes the prefix, and remember the magnitude that is associated with the prefix. Now we'll look at a practice IMAT style question to see how they could actually ask you a question regarding multiples and submultiples. But before we go into that, I wanna look at some SI derived units. Now the multiples and the submultiples, they are important for everyone sitting the IMAT. The SI derived units, well, they're more important for those of you planning to actually study for the physics section. So if you're not planning on studying for the physics section, you can sort of ignore this part. Okay, we'll take a look at the first SI derived unit, and that is the Newton, which is denoted by big N. Now, the Newton is the derived unit for force, and all one Newton really is, is the force required to give a one kilogram object a one meter per second squared acceleration. Now, we will work more with Newtons when we actually look at mechanics and we look at the force equals mass times acceleration formula. For now, I'm not going to go into how any of these units are derived or anything like that. I'm just going to list them here so that you know them and so that you can actually convert other values from them. 
And that'll apply for all the units I'm gonna go through now. I won't actually go into the mathematics behind them or how you use them in physics. No, that's for separate videos. This is just listing the units so you know what quantity they are associated with and what SI units actually make them up because that is actually something the I can assess you on. Okay, so we've covered the Newton. Let's move on to the Joule and that is denoted by an uppercase J. Now, what quantity is the joule associated with? Well, it's associated with energy and work, but also with heat. Energy and work are more common though. And all one joule really is, is the energy transferred or the work done on an object through a distance of one meter, which is why the SI unit is just Newton meters. And if you then take a Newton, which is a kilogram times a meter over second squared, you then get this other SI unit that I put here in the last column. Now, I don't expect you to remember this fourth column here. You can use the third column to actually derive that other quantity. Okay, let's move on to the watt, which is denoted by big W. And the quantity associated with the watt is power. And basically one watt is just one joule per second. And if you've studied physics before, that should make sense because really all power is, is the amount of work done over time. Okay, let's move on to the Pascal, which is denoted by uppercase P and then lowercase a. Quantity associated with the Pascal is pressure. Now all pressure is, is really a certain amount of force applied over a certain area. So we can quantify one Pascal as one Newton of force spread over one meter squared. All right, now let's move on to volts and that's denoted by a big V. Now the quantity associated with volts is voltage, which is easy to remember. And all voltage really is, is the push force. So you can sort of think of it as the pressure pushing electrons through a circuit loop. And we denote that by a joules per coulomb or watts per amp. Okay, now why that's the case is something that we'll look at in another video. For now, we're just looking at the units that you'll be using in the physics section. We're not actually gonna explain how they all work because that would make this video too long. So if you don't fully understand these quantities, don't worry, it's something we'll look at in another video. Okay, let's move on to the ampere or amp, which is denoted by big A. The quantity associated with the amp is current. Now current is just a measure of the rate of flow of electrons. And we can translate that as the amount of coulombs of charge per second. Now a coulomb is just basically a way to denote charge. And I haven't written the separate row for coulombs because the SI units for coulombs is basically just the inverse of this one here for amps. That is C is equal to big A times S. That is you define amps in terms of coulombs and you define coulombs in terms of amps. Okay, let's move on to ohms. Now the quantity associated with the ohm is resistance and that can be denoted as volts over amps. Okay, then we have the Weber. And that is associated with magnetism, specifically magnetic flux. The formal definition is that a change in flux of one Weber per second will induce an electromotive force of one volt. I don't really expect you to understand that at the moment, that makes more sense when you actually look at magnetism, but for now just understand that a Weber is given as volts times seconds. For magnetism, however, the Tesla is more famous and that is denoted by big T. And this is associated with magnetic flux density. That is the amount of Weber's per meter squared. All right, the last SI derived unit that I'll go over is the Hertz, and that is denoted by big H little z. And the quantity associated with the Hertz is frequency, and all Hertz refers to is the amount of cycles per second. For instance, if a rotor turns 50 times in one second, well, then it's got a frequency of 50 Hertz. Now, these are not the only SI derived units in existence. There are definitely more, but these are the important ones for the IMAT. Okay, so as I said, the point of this video is not to explain how all these quantities work and how you calculate them or anything like that. So if you don't fully understand this stuff yet, that's completely fine. The point here is just to list the actual units. And as previously mentioned, don't bother about remembering this fourth column here. That's just something you can derive if you actually know what the SI unit is for these derived units. Okay, before we actually do a practice problem on this, I do quickly want to talk about converting between areas, because this is actually something that a lot of students find difficult. Now, by this I mean, for instance, if you wanted to convert one meter squared into centimeter squared or micrometer squared or something like that. Okay, how does this work? Well, basically, when you're going through multiples or submultiples, you're either dividing or multiplying by a factor of 100. So how does this look? Well, for instance, one meter squared, if you wanted to get to decimeters squared, that is one sub multiple below the meter. 
So you have to times by 100. That is one factor of 100. If you wanted to go the other way instead and go from one meter squared to decameter squared, well, then you have to divide by 100. Now, this will become easier if we actually do a problem together. So let's do that now. Okay, I haven't actually written down an IMAT style question here. We'll just illustrate the concept for now. So let's say we wanted to convert one meter squared into, let's say, millimeters squared. How would we do that? Well, a common mistake people make here is they think, well, one meter is just 1,000 millimeters, so therefore one meter squared must be 1,000 millimeters squared. But no, that is not how it works, unfortunately. What you instead have to do is you have to go through all the sub multiples, and for each sub multiple you pass, you are timesing by a factor of 100. So I'll write it down like this just to illustrate how it works. We have one meter squared. How do we get to the next sub multiple? Well, the next sub multiple is the decimeter. So we have to go by a factor of 100, that is, one meter squared is equal to 100 decimeters squared. Okay, what's the next sub multiple? Well, that's the centimeter. Again, we have to move by a factor of 100, so that becomes 10,000 centimeters squared. Okay, what's the next sub multiple? Well, that's the millimeter squared, so that will be 1 million millimeters squared. So here we have the answer. 1 meter squared is equal to 1 million millimeters squared. Now, this is why it's important to remember your SI units. For instance, you have to know that decimeters is 10 to the minus one of the meter, centimeters is 10 to the minus two of the meter, and millimeters is 10 to the minus three of the meter. If you can remember this, well, then it's very easy. You just go by a factor of 100 for each sub multiple that you cross. Okay, let's go the other direction. What if we wanted to convert one meter squared into kilometers squared? How would we do that? Well, it's the same concept, but here we're dividing by a factor of 100. Okay, so let's actually write out the magnitudes of the multiples going up from the meter. So the first one we have is the decameter, which is just 10 to the power 1 of the meter. Then after that, we have the hectometer, which is 10 to the power 2. And then we have the kilometer, which is 10 to the power 3 of the meter. Okay, remember, for each one of these, we are dividing by a factor of 100. So 1 meter squared is equal to 0 0.01 decameters squared. 1 meter squared is therefore equal to 0 0.0001 hectometers squared. And it is therefore equal to 0 0.0000001 kilometers squared. Now in the actual IMAT exam, you don't really have to write it out like this. You can do it a faster way. And one faster way is just to take, well, if we want to go from one meter squared to kilometers squared, well, then you just have to divide by the factor 100 to the power three, because we're moving three multiples up. And that is equal to this value here. So 0 0.000001 kilometers squared. But really, I don't find this actually takes that long to do. So you do whatever method you feel is most easy to understand. Okay, so we now know how to convert between areas, but we'd also like to be able to convert between volumes. And really, the concept is very similar. There is just one thing I want you to remember when converting between volumes, and that is that one liter is equal to one decimeter cubed. You have to remember this because often volume will be given in liters, or sometimes you will be given it in some multiple of the meter, and then you have to convert it into liters. So you have to understand this relationship here. One liter is equal to one decimeter cubed. Okay, besides that, there's only one more thing you have to remember, and that is that when you are converting between volume, you are moving with a factor of 1,000 for each multiple or submultiple. Okay, so remember that one liter is equal to one decimeter cubed. So what is one liter in terms of meters? Well, if one liter is equal to one decimeter cubed, well, then you have to just move to the next multiple, which is dividing by 1,000, and that'll give you 0 0.001 meters cubed. Okay, what if we wanted to go from one liter to centimeters cubed? Well, then you just have to times by 1,000. So that means that one liter is equal to 1,000 centimeters cubed. You're just going down one submultiple from the decimeter, and that means you're timesing by one factor of 1,000. 
And again, I find this is easy to explain through an example. So let's actually try an IMAT style question. Okay, here we have an example of an IMAT style question. What is 46 deciliters in micrometers cubed? Okay, how would you solve this? Well, let's convert this into liters first. So 46 deciliters, that is equal to 4.6 liters. Now, remember how I said that one liter is equal to one decimeter cubed and that that was very important to remember? Well, if you remembered that, well, then you're gonna know that this is also equal to 4.6 decimeters cubed. Now, we don't want it in decimeters cubed, we want it in micrometers cubed. So we're gonna to have to move upwards by a few factors of 1000. And here you have to know your SI units. And it helps if you just draw out their actual magnitude. So what is a decimeter? Well, that is 10 to the minus one meters. Okay, what is a micrometer? Well, that is 10 to the minus six. So we'll draw them all out here. So 10 to the minus two, 10 to the minus three, 10 to the minus four, 10 to the minus five, and 10 to the minus six is micrometers. That is the one we want. So we're gonna have to move up by a factor of a thousand for all these points here. So to convert 4.6 decimeters cubed into centimeters cubed, well, that would just be 4.6 times 10 to the power three, that is 1000 centimeters cubed. Okay, but we don't want it in centimeters cubed, we want it in micrometers, so we're gonna have to go up by a factor of a thousand all the way up until this point here. So I won't write out the 4.6 each time because that'll take too long. So I'll just move up by a factor of a thousand each time. So that'll be 10 to the power six here, 10 to the power nine here, 10 to the power 12 here, and then 10 to the power 15 for micrometers. So the answer is 4.6 times 10 to the 15 micrometers. That is what 46 deciliters is in micrometers cubed. Oh, we forgot to put the cubed here. Okay, so that gives us answer C. So really not too difficult. All you had to remember was that one micrometer is 10 to the minus six meters. And you also have to remember that one liter is equal to one decimeter cubed. And then it's just a matter of applying the factors. Now let's try a question regarding derived SI units. So the question reads, which of the following is an expression of one watt? Okay, what is a watt? Well, one watt is equal to one joule per second. Okay, what is a joule? Well, a joule is just equal to a Newton meter. Okay, what is a Newton? Well, a Newton is just the force required to accelerate one kilogram to an acceleration of one meter per second squared. Okay, then we can just sub this value in here into the joules. That'll give us kilogram meters squared over second squared. Then we just sub this value in here and that'll give us kilogram meters squared over seconds cubed. And they've written this in a slightly different format. So that is the same as kilograms times meters squared times seconds to the power minus three. So the answer is A. So really for a question like this, all you had to do was actually remember your SI derived units and then you would have gotten an easy mark quite quickly. So remember your SI units and your SI derived units. Not only because you could get a direct question on them in the IMAT like we just did now, but also because it'll help you solve other types of physics problems. If you know what the units that you're working with actually mean, physics becomes a lot easier.